That's Susie over there. Tell by her walk, I can tell by her talk. You can tell by her hair, you can tell everywhere. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, I know you're not here to see me, but I'll introduce myself anyway. I'm Alenka Thompson, and I'm just here to facilitate and make you visit with Alice Gerard. So, um, yeah, I, this is a little bit of a free form uh, hang, workshop, what, what have you talk, but um, Alice has some photos to show us. And uh, you were just telling me earlier today about the story of how these, this collection of photos came, came to be on your computer and here on our screen. So why don't you share that? Yeah, okay, so um, the... Center for Documentary Studies at Duke, which I live in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, the guys who run the place talked me into being the Lehman Brady Joint Chair for one semester. It's, it's specifically designed to hire somebody who is not an academic to come and teach what they know. So that was, and I was like, what? <laughs> I never graduated from college. Anyway, I had a lot of help. Uh, Mike Taylor of His Golden Messenger, he was studying folklore at UNC at the time, and he was my graduate student assistant. So anyway, I worked there for a semester, and they have a lot of great equipment for photography stuff. And they had these machines that would digitize your photos. And I had all these photographs that I'd taken for a number of years, and um, was carrying them around me from pillar to post in any kind of weather. No, no. No hermetically no, sealed, no. Uh, no. sterile environments. And so I thought, well, now is the time I could start digitizing these. And there were, you know, several thousand of them. And um, so I was working way up there. I'd go in there in my spare time and digitize stuff. And, and um, people would come by and look at it and say, oh, hey, that's a great picture. And then finally Tom Rankin, who was running the center at the time, came by and said, yeah, you know, you should do a book. <laughs> and so I to sort of put the whole thought on the back burner, and then I thought, well, yeah, that might be fun to do. And it, but it remained on the back burner for a long time because I just, you know, you really have to sit with it for long periods of time. <laughs> and I was touring and doing other stuff, and, but then I, Tatiana Hargraves moved to Durham, and she, she came over, and, and I got a little grant, and she, started digitizing, she helped I digitize the photos in my house because the center gave me a little machine that you can slide the negatives into it and digitize them again. So that was nice. So there are a lot of photos and I've just been kind of gradually putting together some kind of a narrative and, and going through the photos and thinking, oh, this is a nice one. I could, you know, telling the stories and, and, and my story too to some extent yeah yeah I mean I can imagine it's like thousands of photos oh, gosh, to go yeah. through it is a, a, a total undertaking and I feel like whenever you're doing something documentary that's the, the task is kind of finding the story but at the same time with a photo you look at a photo and you, you yeah, remember just, when you took it yeah that's right and I was not a photographer of capital P. I mean, I, I, that was not my primary focus by any means. Or it, but, you know, I did a lot of documentation of the positions I went to visit and live with and stuff like this. And I just had this feeling that, you know, I should take pictures when I could. I had a Nikomat camera. It's a pretty good camera. And... Um, and document these moments and these people. Because a lot of them weren't going to be around any longer. So. Awesome. 
Well, um, so what are we looking at right now? What is this? Well, uh, I lived in Galax for about nine years, Galax in southwest Virginia, because I was interested in uh, learning a lot of music from the older fiddlers who lived there. And while I was there, there were a bunch of us, James Lindsay and a few other people, James Lindsay with the Mountain Ramblers, and, and they were all very, it was not a union town. There were a lot of hosiery mills, a lot of furniture factories all over, and people worked in those. But there were no unions. But there were several people in this group of friends who were strongly pro-union and had been trying for years to get a union in, but they couldn't. And then Galax Fiddlers <laughs> the Convention, you know, the Moose run the Galax Fiddlers Convention. The Moose, the, the Moose. Organization. I don't know. The, the moose? Is that like, a, like the elves? Moose, the elves. Oh, like oh okay. <laughs> no, we don't, I don't think we have moose out here. We have, we have elks. And, <laughs> so, they, and they always let musicians in free because they played in the, in the contest, and if they weren't there, there wouldn't be any competition. But then they suddenly decided they were going to charge them. And, well, no, what they would do is they would charge you, but then they'd give you your money back when you competed. And then they decided they were only going to give, like, pennies on the dollar back. And so everybody was like, Ugh. and all these union guys, they, they wrote up this little uh, thing, <laughs> which is, these questions. Oh yeah, ask yourself these questions. Musicians make the Galax Gale Fiddlers Convention, not the other way around. And so, and, but they never did. Well, I think they modified it a little bit, but I can't remember if it was gone by the time they did. So, shall we move along? Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, what, what's the next picture? I don't know. No. Ooh, it's going to be a surprise. It's sort of a random collection here. That is Cale Brewer, who uh, was one of the old Galax fiddlers, and I'm trying to remember who he, 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 would, he made recordings back in the day, played some with Pop Stone, and I think, wonderful old fiddler, and by the time I got to meet him, he, his, one of his hands shaked a lot, and he was reluctant to play the fast tunes that he used to play, but he'd occasionally do one and, and it sounded great. <clears throat> this is a beautiful, beautiful photograph. Thank was, you. Was this, it was this in his home? In his home, yeah. He lived near where I lived and it was easy to get over there and visit with him. And he loved having visitors and he loved to talk about his music and, and would play for us. So. Cool. All right. And this is his mother with the banjo, or grandmother, I guess. Wow. And her son playing the fiddle. So he's from the brewer, it's a brewer family. So Beautiful. Him. Yeah. Julia Reese. Julia Reese Green. Yes. And the man is Fred Green. Fred Green and mother. Yeah, because his Mother was a Reese. So you took a picture. This is a, took a picture of his picture. Of this picture. <laughs> yeah, it's a time honored tradition. <laughs> oh, so, oh, yeah, no, go ahead. Okay, that's Matoki Slaughter, who lived in Pulaski, Virginia, and we played together a lot. She was a banjo player, and um, a lot of people heard of her in the beginning because County Records put out a compilation of banjo stuff and she was on that. And, and there was a woman in San Francisco by the name of Margaret Kilgallen. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of her. But, but she got, somehow got hold of that recording and she loved Matoki's music. And she would... Um, do train graffiti, you know, she'd draw a picture of Matoki or write Matoki or Matoki Slaughter on these trains, she and her partner. And um, she, she died 
fairly young from cancer. But that's kind of a nice little side note to Matoki. Wow. I don't think Matoki had never met her or anything like this. Matoki. Well, she there was she claims that she, she you know she had Native American ancestry, and a friend of mine looked up Matoki to see went down Google rabbit hole, you know. And there was a Matoka who was a an, an, uh, Native American woman. And you can, so I don't know. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it was a Native American name anyway. Yeah. And I would not be surprised if she had Native American in her background. That's her with her goats. She had goats. Or that's Doc Boggs. And what's he carrying there? He's getting coal. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, what happened? Uh-oh. Did the thing happen? Do I need to go to settings? No, I don't think it's you this time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We've been having a real good old time with technology. It is us. Okay. Did this, oh, you know what? It's because you're wiggling your computer. Oh, no. No more wiggling the computer. Okay, we're we're plugged in. Okay, well, anyway, uh, so you spent a lot of time with Matoki, and, and it's a uh, okay. Uh, so what's going on? Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Don't touch the computer. Don't, well, well you know, just don't wiggle. Don't wiggle it, okay. Um, okay, sorry, we were looking at Doc Boggs. What's he carrying in that bucket? He's oh. carrying a coal bucket. He's, that's his coal house, where his coal is, and taking it into his house, which is adjacent to the, and his little dog. And uh, yeah, I love that picture. That he, he was from Norton, Virginia, which is way down southwest Virginia. Wonderful banjo player, a singer. Matoki in her living room. I had. Are those her um, grandchildren on the mantel there? I I can't. Yes, those are their grandkids. Wow. And here is we had a picnic one day at my my little hut <laughs> there. And it was outdoors, and we invited all these musicians to come. And on the right there in the front is Tommy Gerald. And on the left is Bernie Mae Dickens. And they had they not, they knew one another, of one another. But she had n never played, well, maybe she played with him once. And, and so at the picnic there, they were. And so they sat down and played together. And the woman playing the guitar used to play some with Matoki. Faye, I don't know where it was. Faye, I got it somewhere. But it was really fun. In the back there is, <laughs> reaching in for another cigarette, is um, <sighs> the guy who did the really nice version of Black Eyed Susie and Cross Tim. Pardon me? Robert Pike? Yes, Robert! Yeah. Robert! <laughs> Well, the, the ones from around Galax would have been sometime in the 80s, because that's when I was there. The um, Doc Box would have been earlier, probably. We were probably on tour. We did this tour uh, that Bernice Regan and Anne Romaine put together in the 60s, when they were both in Atlanta working for the Civil Rights Movement. And um, it, the idea of it was to put together a tour of black and white musicians who would tour in the South, not uh, going up to Newport or Philly or New York or whatever. So, um, and Doc was off and on those tours and sometimes we'd stay at his house. I think that was from that time, which would have been sometime between probably 65 and around 
the mid 60s. Okay, let's see here. That's that's Bertie May. Uh oh, what happened? Oh no, I went back. Oh, you went back. So Bertie May's playing the banjo. Ah. And here she's cooking on her wood stove in her kitchen. <laughs> wow. And that's she, she. That's the only stove she had. That is amazing. Yeah. It's so clean. And she always wore this little apron <laughs> and this little hair knit thing over here. And she, that, that was her look. That's really great. I she love played, these. Yeah, she played a really nice, very elegant kind of banjo style. It's really fun. Like a claw hammer style? Not so much. It was more, it was, it was a mixture of sort of claw hammer and I wish I had music to go along with it, but I didn't put that together. This is Emmett Lundy's old home. Emmett Lundy was a fiddler, uh, a legendary fiddler from around Galax. And this is his home, and this is where I got the idea for that my, my song, uh, whatever the name of it is. Uh, <laughs> it's about... The one about the... The house where the yeah, it's no corn tur torn curtain hanging, yeah. this broken window pane. Tell me, oh, tell me their story again. Yeah. yeah, this is a woman named Sel Snow. She was Tommy Gerald's sister in law, his wife's sister. She, and played, she played banjo. Yeah. This is Nell Smith. Nell was this super great person that lived in Galax. She worked in a furniture factory. She never married. She took care of her mother her whole life. And that was her thing until her mother died. But she loved to write songs, and she wrote a lot of songs. Um, and she would she had friends, you know, who would back her up. Some if she and we and she wrote. Well, I remember one song was, There'll Be No Wheelchairs in Heaven. <laughs> and then the one that Kay Justice and Gail Gillespie and I recorded was, The Devil's Gonna Meet You Down at the Old Still. And it was all about a, a no good husband who would get drunk and come home and he, his nose would go in the plate in the breakfast and she was gonna beat him with a two by four. And <laughs> I think she had some bad Relationships. That sounds real authentic. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this photo is also from the when you were living. No, in that this is from when I went back to visit her after I had moved away, and probably in the late nineties. This is Roscoe Parrish with the fiddle, and his sister at the organ. Leona Parish, and they, Leona, they lived in a, a beautiful farm, they had a beautiful farm that was in their family, their father built the house, he made the bricks for the chimney on, they were very self-sufficient, there was beautiful furniture that the father had made in the house, you know, like a cherry table, and, and they, they did baskets, and oh, it was just amazing, and um, she she was a school teacher, and she played guitar and also this, the pump organ. And Roscoe played the fiddle and the banjo, and they they loved to play together, They'd go over and visit them. Was this photo taken? Um, that was in Carroll County, which is the adjacent county to I was living in. And so this would have been taken. This would have been taken in the eighties. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's. Um, Etta Baker on the right, and her sister, Cora Phillips, on the left. And they, she played, well, she played the banjo, but mostly she played the guitar. And she uh, played Piedmont blues style of picking, and was just loved to play music. She quit for a long time when she got married because her husband would get jealous. Oh. And so then she took it back up after he died. Oh, as, as you hear that story a lot. Yeah, that's, I, that's a familiar uh, yeah. one. Yeah. And Cora was 
her sister, their, their ancestry is African American, European American, and Native American. And there's, you know, it's, and they both play. So would they play banjo, like a, like a blues style banjo and guitar, or? Etta picked the banjo like this. And, but I would say mostly she played the guitar. Ah, uh, got it. And Cora never went out in public and played. She just sat around home. But she's been recorded along with Etta. So you can probably. And this is the great Mabel Carter. And um, this was taken at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival at a workshop. And she was on the workshop. And it just, it just struck me because she, her famous, wonderful Gibson guitar. And on it is this very, very cheap capo that we used to call, we used to call it the Playtex Living Capo. You, 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 swing, you put it on there, you swing it around, stretch it over, and it goes in a little hole. But it was like, it seemed very incongruous to me. But not so much at the time. But then I looked and said, that's really nice. This is a woman named Mabel Cawthorn who lived in Livonia, Georgia, and uh, played the banjo. And this is Doc Boggs again in Blackie, Kentucky. Oh, back to Mabel. <laughs> she grew pot. And she, she went to jail several times for it. <laughs> I mean, not good that she went to jail, but like, I mean, that's a... That's she's story. a tough woman. Yeah, she's, she seems tough. <laughs> and Black, this is this was taken in Blackie, Kentucky, which is a little town in eastern Kentucky, um, where we often went because uh, there was a lot of action there, anti-strip mining stuff going on, and and you know we'd all the tour would often stop at places where they'd say, "Can you come to our little union rally thing and play?" And we'd do that, and. Uh, the guy who was the super activist in that was from there. His name was Joe Begley. And this is Doc showing some kids. Yeah, his adoring his, his, fans. Yeah, I know. So I just want to pause for a minute. Yeah. You mentioned the union again. Do you think that's, is that kind of coming, is union activism and that kind of activism sort of emerging as a through line in this? photography book, or is that just no. happening to be what's coming up today? No, it isn't. Um, and what happened, the furniture factories are still there. I mean, I just think all the people who were trying so hard to get them in, they just sort of gave up after a while. It just, there was too much going against them. All, you know, the people who own the town, basically, like the Vaughns, the fact the furniture factory. And the hosiery mills moved overseas, so then they didn't, they weren't around, and then, you know, so, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. This is Elizabeth Cotton, again in Blackie, Kentucky, playing for, and the woman to the right of her with the long, to, to the, she's on the side of the banjo head, not the neck, okay. is Anne Romain, who was one of the people who started the tours. And it's from Gastonia, North Carolina. And her adoring fans. Yeah, and, and that's Liva playing the banjo for everybody. <coughs> and this was taken at the Smithsonian Festival. That's Elizabeth Cotton on the right and Bessie Jones on the left. Bessie Jones was a wonderful singer and the Georgia Sea Island singers, they turned out. Right, I see. Yeah, I see. She has a it looks like a tambourine in her hand. Yeah, yeah. She she would do that when she when she played. She the did it when when they would sing, and when they would play their games too. Awesome. I just like this. This was a trip to Nashville, the DJ convention, and this is backstage at the Ryman when it you know the old Ryman. <laughs> Please That's put simple. trash in quotation marks in the trash can. <laughs> and then the bottom is something. It's not. It's oh, it's that simple. simple. It's that simple. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, God. 
And this is on the left, Sarah Ogden Gunning, Hazel Dickens, and Olabel Reed. Three powerhouses. I'll say. Is that what? Is no. that text I don't in, know. in the background? No, it's just some random dude walking by, I think. Oh, the lower right. Oh, the lower right. That's oh. Ralph Rinsler on the lower right. <laughs> just the front the part of his face. The nose and the mustache. <laughs> but he was the organizer of the Smithsonian Festival, which is where this was taken oh. in D.C. Uh, this is Sunset Park. You may have heard of some of these parks that, where there was country music and bluegrass music people would come through. And Sunset Park was one, New River Ranch was another. They were up yeah. in uh, just over the Maryland line into Pennsylvania. And on the left is Ralph Stanley, a woman named Joan Shagan, who was a fan in the middle, and then George Shuffler on the right, and my daughter. <laughs> Hang up. <laughs> Corey. When was this photo taken? I'm going to say 69 or so, 69. Wow. And this is again in Blackie, Kentucky. That's Reverend Curly Brown in the front and Austin Miller in the back with the banjo. He was a local banjo player and, and, and uh, Reverend Brown used to go on the tours with us all, all, all the time. He was just this fixture on the tours. He was a blind singer and player from uh, America's Georgia, and he played on the street a lot. This is New River Ranch, so this would have probably been about 65, and there was a banjo contest there, and uh, it, if you, I have another picture that shows a whole lineup of people. Two women. <laughs> this is Louise Foraker. Is my pick, is my, the one on the left. Yeah. Great banjo player, and she's been recorded. She, there are a couple of songs on some Smithsonian Folkways compilation. And next to her is Arnold Dickens, Hazel's brother, youngest brother. And it uses a stage, and there were these signs all along the top, you know, the town side, advertising the local. This is Blackie, Kentucky again at their community center, having a dance. Wow. Yeah. This is Mabel Kaufman again. She loved Charlie Pride. <laughs> She's a big picture of there. Although she was herself a little bit racist, you have to say. But anyway, it's complicated. It is. <laughs> and this is, um, I just took this picture because it, it, we used to stop at this place and eat when we were headed down from D.C. down south on Route 11 or whatever it was before they built 81. And it just, you know, it was a poignant sign. Can you read it? We have done our best to make you feel welcome at home or while on the road with good country, cook food, and give you the best of service. We cannot keep all our employee that has done their best to serve you and make you welcome and operate Elliston truck stop after 81 interstate opens unless you continue to drop by regular for fuel, gas, and food. The Elliston Truck Stop Incorporated has appreciated your friendship and bus business, thank you, uh, and hope to be able to continue our service to you. Thank you. Kind of poignant. I honestly don't know. Oh, and that's Tex Logan with Kenny Baker. And Tex Logan with Don Stover. <laughs> and this is Earl Gilmore from West Virginia. He's a singer, guitar player. And this was taken at the Pipe Stem, West Virginia. L the little festival they started there. It was on the property of Don West, who was an activist and a poet, and Hetty West's father, if you've heard of Hetty West. And, um, 
So they got, they just put together this little festival. They had cinder blocks and planks on it. They built a little stage. And, and uh, Earl Gilmore was a local singer, really amazing singer, this very, I don't know how to describe it. It's like very edgy voice, just wonderful. Did he uh, sing blues? Yeah, mostly. Mm -hmm. That would have been in the, that was 69. I know. Wow, it's, it's a very modern earring look, it's yeah. true. Yeah. Wouldn't be out of place today. <laughs> oh, he's such a great, you know who that is? Pretty sexy photo, huh? <laughs> this was taken, he did a show, I forget where, Watermelon Park, south of, in Virginia, south of Washington, D.C. I think looking over his shoulder is his steel player, I think. Like, what's his name? Roy. Roy? Somebody, anybody know? And, but I just love the picture of Merle. Yeah. He was there with Bonnie, his ex-wife, or soon-to-be wife. Anyway, Bonnie Owens. Who can keep track? Who married, might have been married to Buck Owens. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he stole her away. Well, uh oh, we've got a we've got a waving hand in the audience. A lot of the photographs are black and white. Do you like black and white, or did, did they digitalize them to be black and white? No, they were black and white okay. to begin with. And there was a color photo earlier. So Sorry. A couple, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how close were you with this picture? Was he on stage this time, or? I had a telephoto lens too, so I probably wasn't. I was probably close, but yeah. you know, I was there because I was going to do an interview with him over the song Oki from Muskogee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we went into his bus afterwards, and he did the interview with me, but the, the air conditioning was so loud, you could oh, barely no. make it out. But the interview's in the Southern Folklife Collection at UNC, and, and they, they can make it a little better, I think. Well, at that time, there was a little blowback about right. it. Um, and I think he sort of picked up on that, and he, he said, you know, it's just kind of being lighthearted about it. The Okies didn't like it? No, it wasn't the Okies. Okay. The hippies, the hippies. I'm proud. Yeah, hippies the didn't like it. From no, I, I know. I couldn't <laughs> figure out who would like it less. So the hippies, the hippies didn't the hippies. like it. The hippies. I see. It, you know, it was the anti- you know, it was, he was a, the song was kind of a love it or leave it type song. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But he was such a great singer. And this is Tommy Gerald and Luther Davis. Luther was a wonderful old fiddler that lived about a mile down from me in Galax. He was in his 90s when I first met him, like wow. 92 or something like that. Still playing, still had a memory like a, Trap door or whatever, what did I say? Like a trap. Steel trap. <laughs> Thank you very much. And here they are again. That's Tommy's daughter, Ardini, and she's meeting Luther for the first time and shaking his hand. And then Tommy's on the Luther's Luther's right. And Ernest Deese is on Luther's left. Did you this sort of oh, go ahead? This was that picnic we Oh, okay, so this is at the same event. Do you yeah. feel like you ended up facilitating meetings between these various folks that you were trying to hang out with? Occasionally, and... like in this situation, we the idea for this situation was just we wanted to have a big picnic invite all the musicians that we knew in here. And they came and, you know, we had food and every black people sitting on them. And it was really fun because they were... John Rector came, and um, anyway, John Patterson, Hillary oh, yeah. Gayhart, Bobby Patterson, all, anyway. And this is um, Annie Troxell on the left, and Clyde Davenport on the right. They're having a little tete-a-tete there. He's saying something. And she, she's a singer. She was, she was a sister of 
the Troxel Brothers, um, who played fiddle and banjo. This is just a jam session in Galax, since sometime in the 80s, and some of you might recognize people. I know this guy's name, bass player. Uh, oh, wow. Alex. Alex, yes. But I don't really know anybody else. Jody Platt. Oh, is that Jody Platt on Jack small Fontanella. guitar? And Jack Fontanella on the guitar. Jody okay. Platt and Jack Fontanella. Yeah. And you do, do you know the guy on the right at all? Jack Fontanella. That's Jack Fontanella. Fontanella. And the banjo, are you the yeah, banjo player in the middle there. Anybody recognize him? The mystery banjo player. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're crowdsourcing uh, yeah. IDs for Alice's book right, right yeah. here and now. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've had to remind myself of who a lot of people were, and I, I, mean, I do a lot of googling and a lot of. Uh, but this is in the stalls at Galax. They used to have stalls there that they kept livestock in. Yeah. And, you know, people who got there early might want to get a stall because it would be protected. And uh, so this is in one of the stalls. They don't have the stalls anymore. They got room. Oh, well, they got room. They got room. This is Dan. <laughs> I know. He was one of the, let's get a union in here, guys. And he played guitar with um, Quit Sizemore's band. <laughs> and this was at the DJ convention in Nashville. And it's the Birds with Clarence White, the one, that's Clarence. <laughs> and, and when would this photo have been taken? I think it was around... 68, maybe, 69, somewhere there. I should have written all these dates down, but. And this is, oh, on the left is Otis Burris as a much older man. And, and Eldridge Montgomery is next to him. Eldridge played guitar with the Mountain Ramblers. And of course, Otis was the fiddle player. Tatiana played one of his tunes last night. <clears throat> and he used to play like that. And now he still played really well. We had a little bluegrass band with Otis and Eldridge and James Lindsay. And we'd go around and play at radio stations and stuff. And he was still a great fiddler. But he just, he ruined his health with alcohol and just stuff like this. And, and so he's kind of little, but, but he had stopped drinking by that time. <clears throat> and it was just great. I loved playing with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. There he is again, like a little gnome. <laughs> so cheerful. I know. He's happy to see you. Yeah, he, he's a cheerful guy. Oh, wow. Look, Yeah, this would be the, at the Fiddler's Convention. That's, that's um, at a Cora Phillips and his sister. And again, but I think this was a grandson. I don't remember his name. So is this? Um, that was in Edda's house. And it looks like uh, this was set up for a recording session. Is that right? That's what I'm seeing there. Mic stands. I think maybe uh, I. I was Cece Conway was with me, and she was recording stuff. Uh oh. That's the last photo, Alice. Is that the last photo? That's the last photo. Really? Yeah, this happened okay. when we were when we were tech checking. Okay, well. So when was this photo taken? In it the, would have been in the mm, nah, nah, late 80s. Yeah, or, like, I was going to say, I, I think what I love about this photo is that she's wearing this kind of timeless, old-timey dress, but then she's got these... Nice, nice kicks. <laughs> sure. Oh, thank you. Yes, certainly. Thank you. So, um, we've been mentioning this, but uh, the BOTMC has these beautiful attribution cards available 
And uh, I, I, this photo of Etta Baker um, that has been uh, modified by the wonderful artist um, whose name is Zoe Sinclair. Um, <laughs> the artwork by Zoe Sinclair, but the photo by Alice Gerard. <laughs> These are free and they're out in the lobby or um, Right now they're on my lap, so uh, I gotta go get some for you before you put them back out. You, you got it. Yes. They disappear. Yeah, um, and uh, I think we might still have some from last year's uh, collection. So uh, check them out. The beautiful art and also a little bit of history on the back. The attribution cards. We've got Etta Baker and Andrew and Jim yeah. Baxter. So um, that's the end of the photos, but. Uh, so, Let me just say one thing. Etta, I mean, Cora also, I have pictures of her with her hat. It was a like a sunbonnet. I mean, not, not a sunbonnet, but a hat, you know, like a, with a wide brim and decorated all the way around the brim with flowers. Aww. And she I have a wonderful picture of him sitting on a porch playing you know, with his hair hat on. <laughs> it was really nice. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So you've been working on this photo book. Since, well, off, mostly off, lately more on because I really want to get it done. And, uh, you know, when I go home, I'll get back to it, I guess. Is it sort of, I mean, I, I sort of asked earlier about, you know, union and activism, is that sort of a common theme in the book? But, and you said no, but are there any sort of common themes and narrative threads that are emerging? This was a huge issue for me. It was how to present it. So the, the thing I thought of was, we'll just have these sections. And they don't, they're not necessarily chronological, but, um, and that's kind of how I ended yeah. using, doing it. So there's like one about being in, living in Galax, there's, going to be another, it's just visits, because there's a lot of visiting going on. Yeah. And, I uh, you know, stuff like that. So, um, and I, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out to some extent. I talked to the guy at UNC Press, and the thing, the biggest problem I have is choosing photographs, because there's so many of them. And so I've, I've, I've managed to get a little bit of a handle on Google Docs, and I'm writing the narratives down in Google Docs and then putting a folder with all the photos that I think look appropriate to this section. <laughs> and then somebody else can look through them and pick out one of them. Delegate, delegate, delegate. <laughs> well, so. does anyone have any, any questions? I, I really appreciate folks shouting out, but. Yeah. Yeah, Penny, what do you got? I really want to know, too. The question is, <coughs> sorry, sorry, the question is, I, I'm going to come around, but the question is, how does Alice care for her voice? Unfortunately, I don't care for it very well, but I'm, I'm realizing that as I get older, if I don't sing a fair amount, like every day or every other day, that it's really harder to get back into good, vo <clears throat> good voice. And so I'm considering, you know, going to a voice coaching, voice coaching getting some exercises to do, because <clears throat> it's, it's, it can be problematic. All right, I'm coming right over here. Thank you. Um, it's exercise. wonderful that you're here, thank you. Uh, I used to know a fiddler named Joe Meadows from West Virginia. I wonder if you ever played with him. Um, I know, I've met him, but I never played with him. Yeah. You played with Jim and Jesse, didn't he? Hold on, hold on. Did he play with Jim and Jesse? Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so you mentioned that the, you're um, sending the pictures to uh, uh, 
a press. So is there anything that, um, that we could do to help get this project um, that Susie? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot all about that. Yes, there will be a, a GoFundMe page at some point uh, to help get the rest of the photos digitized and get, you know, possibly produce it and everything. Yeah, well, maybe we'll uh, find, a good way to find out more about that is sign up for the Burn the Old Time Music Convention uh, email newsletter. We'll share it out. Good idea. Hi, Alice. These are amazing photographs. Um, Thank you. And uh, there's a lot of through lines that you could tell stories with here, but there was a lot of pictures of women playing banjo and guitar and fiddle. And yeah, what do you want to say about gender and women and in the domestic side and the public side and the gathering side through these photographs? Hmm. Yes. Well, back in the day when, I mean, the women who are shown, I and mean, there are a lot of women who play music, they tended to not play out in public so much. But there were always professional women entertainers like Cousin Emmy, like Wimily Cooper, Molly O'Day, who toured and played on the radio a lot. So there were those, and then there were just the people who played at home. Um, and you know, Ralph Stanley gives credit to his mom for teaching him the banjo. Um, Tommy, and I think that you know, the the dances were places where a lot of people played out, and they could be pretty rough. <laughs> Tommy has a big scar on his neck from one knife encounter at a dance where a wimp woman sewed him up right there with some uh -oh. string or something that she had. And, uh, but, so I think that, I mean, a lot, there were a lot of alcoholic men playing music. And you know, that didn't sit too well with a lot of the women and they probably mistreated the women a lot when they got drunk and why would they want to go to play out in public with these guys, you know. So, but, but it also it was truly, you know, the woman stays home, takes care of the kids and cooks, and the guy works and can go out and play music. It was a lot of that. But that's changing a lot. And, you know, the new generation of people, musicians, which includes many of us and you, you know, we don't have those same views about it. And there's a lot more women playing music now. But there were a lot of them that just never were recognized. Um, Bertie May, you know, she was, she, she played all the time, but her husband, and her husband, Marvin, was this wonderful man. I mean, she kept her banjo. It was a heavy resonator banjo in a heavy case under her bed. And she was kind of a little bit frail in, in build. And Ma she'd sit down in the chair, and Marvin would go get the banjo out from under the bed, and just plop it into her lap, and she'd play, play. But he was, you know, he was totally encouraging of her music, as opposed to Etta, who said she quit playing because her husband was jealous of her all the time. And so there were all these, there were many different kinds of situations, but women did not play out as much back, back in the day, when they were young, I'm talking about. Right, either because they didn't want to, or yeah. because of pushback from yeah. their partner, or right. from other, yeah. other men. Oh, here we go. Square exercise. Put it in. Well, um, that sort of reminded me uh, about, you know, there were women that played, but then there were couples that played. Uh, I'm thinking of the Kimballs, for instance. Do you have any, like, stories about that, or other people that were couples that played, and, you know, were both, like, equally good musicians, or? Not too many, actually. And the Kimballs were one, for sure. Um, 
but just off the top of my head, I can't think of anybody else who, who were couples that actually played together. It seemed like there were a couple of uh, siblings who played together, or mothers and, and sons who played together, but not so many couples. Right. I mean, Bertie May, Bert, we call her Bert, she played with her family, her whole family, all her brothers and sisters played music. That she was a coddle, and she was the sister of Hughes Coddle, who was a great old-time fiddler, and a lot of others of her. So brothers and sisters would play together. Uh, although I've heard stories about that the brothers didn't encourage the sister, you know, don't you dare take my banjo down from under the bed and play it. And and they would, of course. <laughs> so it was, yeah. But there were there were families of musicians. It wasn't it wasn't usually just one kid. Where that, that where that vulture song came from? Wasn't that a couple? Oh, that's a um, That came from a recording made by Bobby Fulcher of um, Delta and D Hicks from the Cumberland Plateau area of Tennessee, and you could hardly understand. I, I played, I said, I don't want to sing that song. And I played it, played it, played it. And I couldn't understand half of what he was saying. So I called Bobby Fulcher and I said, you know, what's going on with this song? And um, so he told me lots of interesting stuff that he knew, that he said, you can get the words. They're in the Duke Library. And it was originally sung, D learned the song from his father. D was illiterate, but his father was literate and had gone to school. And so I went to the Duke Library and they had a sheet music thing of the, called the Vulture of the Alps. And it had a picture of some guy in later hosen and some woman hanging up clothes and then a vulture coming down and st stealing the baby, which is what the song is about. And um, so, and it was sung originally by a group called the Hutchinson family, who were abolitionist singers from the Northeast somewhere. And they would go around and sing so songs and, and talk about abolition. And um, so, we don't know how it came got into Dee's repertoire, but then I found this book in the Duke Library called like the second grade reader or something like that. And it had this song in it as a recitation. Some, you know, but it was, it, it was kind of a grim song, but I guess it, it might have been the fourth grade reader or something like this. And, but the vulture steals the baby and they, and they, you know, takes it away and they, um, for years, they don't know where he's gone or they can't find him. But then, all of a sudden, some mountain climber comes in to one of their eat supper with them after a climb in the mountains, and, he, and they're sitting around the fire talking, and he's recounting this story of how he climbed up there and found the skeleton of the little boy. And the last verse talks about how he was still wearing the red cap that he had on. I know, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> and um, it's a great song. And we think that probably the way it got to D. Hicks is through his father, who probably learned it in school. And then they put a kind of a generic tune to it. Da 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 that's all we know. We don't know for sure, and they're dead. Yeah. Is your book going to include your photos of your career, like pictures other people have taken of you and Hazel and the bands you've been in and, and things like that? It's 
going to include some pictures of Hazel, and I hadn't really thought of putting me in it, but I do have, I mean, there is a little bit about, about me in it, and it names some of the bands I've played with and stuff like this, and, and, and there are a few pictures by other people, like my husband, before he was killed, took a lot of pictures of the kids, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> I have some of them in there. And uh, and then I, then after he died, I started taking pictures. Even then, the no pictures of mother, that's a, well, <laughs> common, that's a common problem. Yeah, I, can, I, I might think about that a little bit, because I oh, love some of the pictures of the Harmony sisters. Oh, yeah. and, uh, Beverly, yeah, and, but you know, they were taken by other people, but that's okay. Um, I think, are we, is this 11 to 12? Yes. yes. Okay, well, alas, it's, it's past 12, so I think this is it, but uh, thank, you for thank you all so much for coming. I think we're going to have them in the lobby. That's probably the best. And uh, stick around for... Er